Well, uh, I always have mixed feelings when Hollywood takes on biblical themes. Um, I think in general, I think it's a good thing when they attempt to take on themes like that um, because it forces us to enter into a dialogue with what they get right and what they get wrong. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But the part I showed you right there isn't too far off what you find when you read the Bible and try to see the story the Bible is telling. It's the story we're going to look at today. One of the most well-known stories of all the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6. We call it Noah and the Ark. And it's really more of a story about other things, but I want to take on the whole story today and see how far we can get. Genesis 6, 5 through 22. Let me read this part of the story for you. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man in the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and bird of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way in the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you and every living thing of all flesh. And you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. And Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Okay, we're biting off a huge hunk here today, but let's take on a couple of the most difficult questions that everyone always asks, and then we're going to get to the point of today's, um, today's message. First, did the flood really happen, or is this some sort of a myth or parable that the Bible gives us? Um, my position is yes, this is a, an actual event that took place in real history, and I say that because, as I often say, if you believe Genesis 1-1, Okay? In the beginning, God created. If you believe those five or six words, then it's, you, have, you have to accept that the flood is certainly possible to have happened. God has technology. He can do whatever he wants. It's, everything belongs to him. If he created everything from nothing, he can create something from, not, from something. So he can do this. So I, I start there. But there are also other ways to look at this. There are, for example, flood myths in dozens and dozens of other cultures around the world. Many of you have studied these things back in college. Sumerian flood myth, Babylonian flood myth, the Africa Maasai tribe, one of the oldest continuous civilizations on the face of the earth, has its own flood myth. Listen to what it says. This is from the Maasai people in Africa. Once upon a time, the rivers began to flood. Then God told two people to get into a ship. He told them to take lots of seed and to take lots of animals. The water of the flood eventually covered the mountains. Finally, the flood stopped. Then one of the men, wanting to know if the water had dried up, sent a dove loose. The dove returned. Later, he set loose a hawk, which did not return. Then the men left the boat and took the animals and the seeds with them. That's from the Maasai people. And there are Irish myths, Finnish myths, Indian myths, Polynesian myths, almost 200 different flood myths from cultures around the world. Either there's something in every human civilization that wants to create flood mythology, or you could argue something happened once, sometime in the human memory remembers it and they tell the story. The next question people ask is, was the flood global or local? Now, for some of us, uh, this doesn't really matter. We accept Genesis 1-1. God can do whatever, whatever he wants. We take it at, at face value. For others of you who are sort of scientific engineering types, you've always had questions about this. There are three basic positions. I'm going to cover them very briefly today. There's an argument for the global flood, that is, the, the waters covered the whole globe of the earth as high as the highest mountains. Again, the first answer is, sure, God can do whatever he wants. Secondly, it's the most complete image uh, for judgment of the sinfulness of humankind. And thirdly, there are flood myths all over the world that pop up all over the place, so maybe it, maybe it was global. There's arguments for that. 
The problems with a global argument for flood is that basic science tells you the sheer volume of water needed is kind of a problem. Uh, where did it come from? Where did it all go? In that amount of time, it's difficult to answer those questions. It's also difficult to explain how all species of all creatures in the entire earth could have been jammed in uh, to one boat, the ark. Uh, so that, th there's an argument for global flood. So the second position is that the flood was more local or regional in nature. The arguments for this interpretation include the general viewpoint of an ancient man. The perspective of the storyteller in the, old par in the most ancient parts of the Bible is almost always local. Because when you think of it, the people who lived five, seven, eight thousand years ago did not see the world the way we see the world. They didn't see the globe. They didn't even know the earth was round or, or spherical. They, they saw the world they lived in. Remember that flood we had in the Fox Valley 15, 18 years ago or so when people had five feet of water in their basement and there we were canoes in front of my house in Batavia going up and down the street, like three feet of water out. It would happen, it was a flash flood, happened for a few days. Well, my, I had very young sons at that time. And, and uh, it would have been perfectly natural for my five-year-old, six-year-old son to stand at our front door and look out and go, the whole world is covered with water. Because it would have been true. His whole world, as far as he could see and experience his neighborhood, was covered with water. That's kind of the perspective of the ancient peoples. Some scholars also argue that the ancient Hebrew language used here is more flexible than the words we translate them into in English. For example, the Hebrew word translated earth can be also translated as a, a local land area, sort of, sort of the land of Israel or the land of Geneva. Uh, the Hebrew word that does mean the whole expanse of the earth is not used in this story. Maybe there's a reason. Uh, ancient people did not understand the size of the globe, and they had not yet settled all over the world, some scholars argue. And so you, uh, that leads to uh, the, the assumption that maybe the flood was in the general region of Mesopotamia, uh, between the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, Tigris and Euphrates, sort of what we call the Middle East. There's another interesting argument from Scripture itself. In Psalm 104, uh, let me read this for you. We read, He set the earth on its foundations that can never be moved. It's talking about creation. This is a psalm talking about Genesis 1. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. But you're, at your rebuke, the waters fled. At your sound, the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They overflowed the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. So the psalmist looks back to creation and says, once God established the waters, they were never going to overflow those boundaries. So that, that's tough to justify that with a global flood where it says that they did overflow all the boundaries, just a point of interest. So a regional understanding of the flood answers some questions about the number of animal species in the ark. It would have been a regional gathering of animals. Uh, and, but the problem is the intent of God's judgment was global. So that leads to a third option, which is a hybrid view that says the flood was regionalized sort of in the Middle East, and that's as far as human, human civilization had extended at that point, and many take that position. Now, the point of me mentioning all that is to say the debate as to the physical scope of the flood continues to this day. It's extremely difficult to answer, and it's more of an issue of faith than anything else. But it doesn't really impact the meaning and power of the story itself. Now, a couple of interesting things about the ark, because I'm sure that's... Uh, as guys, we're interested in stuff like this. The dimensions and building instructions we find in this very, very ancient part of the Bible are structurally sound. A cubit was the distance from a man's elbow to the tip of his finger, roughly, about 18 inches. So if you multiply that out, the ark was about 450 feet long, you know, which is a football field and a half, 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. Those, by the way, match the relative dimensions of modern shipbuilding for stability. Uh, by modern day standards, it was built for great stability while floating, which is all the ark was required to do. It wasn't going anywhere, it was surviving and floating. There was also space around the top deck for ventilation. That's what it means when it says, finish it to a cubit above. There was an 18 inch opening at the top of the ark for ventilation. If you had a bunch of animals in there, you know why you need ventilation and for light and so forth. Question, how can an ancient man living roughly five to 10,000 years before Christ accomplish such a massive engineering feat? How did he build the ark? Back to Genesis 1.1. Remember, God has technology that we can understand. Maybe God helped him. Uh, I don't have any problem with that. But Noah did have some technology on his side. We are told in Genesis 4, prior to the ark story, that one of Cain's sons uh, forged all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Genesis 4 tells us that. So this is the, there, there were tools available to him, and he had time, the resource of time. 
by biblical calculations, it took him at least 75 years uh, to build the ark from beginning to end. So Noah's story, in the end, is really not about engineering or geophysics. That's not really why we're here. It's about human depravity. It's about divine judgment. It's about God's grace. And it's about one man's faith in obedience. So having covered all that stuff, I'd opened up all kinds of questions in your minds. Let's jump into what I want to talk about today. First, the battle of righteousness. The battle of righteousness. One of the most frequent questions I get about the Bible is why would God judge the world? Why did God destroy all living things? Why did he destroy with the flood? The Bible says it this way, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Now, as people living in modern North America, we have a hard time imagining, I think, the evil and violence of the world at that time. Uh, one scholar I read estimates, and I have no idea how he create, came up with this estimation, but that at that time in human civilization, murder was so rampant that roughly only 5% of the population survived. We're talking about a brutal, savage time in human history. Following the flood, just a few chapters later in Genesis 19, we read an example of this. This is now after God's judgment, when things are supposedly better. Two angels come in Genesis 19, come to visit Lot in the city of Sodom. Uh, the men of the city surround the house, thinking there are two visitors uh, from outside the city in this home. And the men of the city surround the house and demand that Lot bring out his guests so they can gang rape them. That's in Genesis chapter 19. Lot then refuses to do that and offers his virgin daughters instead. That story is right in the Bible, Genesis 19. God then destroys Sodom with his judgment. This is following the flood. And by the way, one of the things the movie Noah did a did a good job. One of the things they got right was human depravity. If you watch the movie, one of the things they got right was the darkness of human depravity and sin. Tubal Cain, who was actually the villain of the story, and I didn't realize until I reread the story, is listed as one of Cain's sons in the Bible. So that, that guy's a historical figure. Tubal Cain um, has several lines in the movie that are, I think, dead on. You don't find them in the Bible, but they're dead on. He says at one point in the movie, the creator does not care what happens in this world. Nobody has heard from him since he marked Cain. We are alone, orphan children, cursed to struggle by the sweat of our brow to survive. Damned if I don't do everything it takes to do just that. Damned if I don't take what I want. Then he says, God has made us in his image. We are to subdue and dominate. So be a man and seize whatever you want. He says, I will build a new world in my image. And then he challenges one of Noah's sons by saying, a man isn't ruled by the heavens, a man is ruled by his will. If you're a man, you can kill. Are you a man? It's very subtle, but you can listen and hear they got that part of the story right. I believe history is full of illustrations of this kind of, and it's a great biblical word, wickedness. Think about the Holocaust in the middle of the 20th century. Think about the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. We see echoes of the same corruption all around us today, but we don't see it with the same perspective as we look at this story in Genesis. Take today's sex slave trade around the world. Slavery exists today, it's just in a whole different dimension. Thousands and thousands of young women, thousands and thousands of even children, captured and taken into what's called the sex slave industry today. The guy in Gary a couple weeks ago admitted to killing at least seven women, dumping their bodies in abandoned buildings. We're, we're uh, repulsed by stories of ISIS terrorists beheading people in the Middle East. A 14-year-old last week in, Wisconsin, in Washington State walked into his school and shot four classmates, killing two of them because he was mad some girl wouldn't go out with them. These illustrations are all around us. Multiply those times uh, a million times, and you have Genesis chapter 6, all right? We're 10 generations from Adam. How did it get so bad so fast? 10 generations. If we back up, we've told the story already in the first four weeks of team. God, gave his, uh, God created all things as good, all things good. God gave his command. You can have everything in the garden, but not this, the fruit of this one tree. The serpent enters the garden. The serpent is the great adversary, the enemy, uh, the, the liar. He questions God. He lies to Eve. Adam stands by and does not confront his enemy, does not confront the lies. Uh, and they fall into sin, and they're cast out of the garden. Cain, then Adam's son, offers an unacceptable sacrifice to God. He resents God's correction. He resents his brother for offering a better sacrifice, so he takes his brother out and kills him in the field. Sin is loosed in the world. Humankind is fallen. 
So the flood has three purposes. The flood is to bring judgment on sin and evil, to preserve a righteous remnant of people, Noah and his family, and to begin salvation history, what we call salvation history. Notice um, in this story, as in th- throughout the whole Bible, when God is going to bring judgment, he first brings a warning. He brings a warning. God gives people an opportunity to repent, to change, to obey. For 75 years, Noah is, you'll find out in a few minutes, Noah is presenting the truth, is preaching righteousness, is demonstrating, explaining why he's building the ark. 75 years, people have a chance to change and repent. The whole Bible is God's warning about what's coming. There is judgment coming, and yet there is grace, there is salvation. The flood's a picture of God's judgment on all sin. The ark is a picture of God's grace and salvation from sin. And then we read, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. In the midst of all this corruption, all this wickedness, Noah is a righteous man. If you read back earlier in Genesis 4 and 5, you see just a bit about Noah's ancestors. In Genesis 4, we learn that Cain, the one who killed his brother, went on to have many children. One of them, his name was Tubal Cain, who was the bad guy in the movie. Uh, we learn that Adam and Eve had another son named Seth, and that Seth had a son. And the Bible says at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Some believe that Cain's uh, descendants became uh, sort of evil, the wickedness of the world, whereas Seth's descendants followed God. Uh, we don't know exactly how that plays out because the Bible scripture is not terribly clear. Uh, The movie Noah portrays Noah as the last of Seth's line and that Cain's line has taken over the world with evil. So Noah's the last righteous man living. Noah's great-grandfather was a man named Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. So even as humanity became more and more depraved and sin became more and more entrenched, there were men who walked with God. You know, and that's still possible. It's still possible to be in an environment that is completely anti God or uh, ignorant or uh, hostile and to live a righteous life. That's still possible. Noah becomes an example of a righteous man in a dark world. Noah was one of those who found favor with God. Now, when the Bible says Noah was a righteous man, it doesn't mean he was perfect. It doesn't mean he was sinless. Only Jesus was sinless. But it does mean that he walked with God. He lived in relationship with God. He served God. And in comparison to his generation, he was righteous. In 2 Peter 2, in the New Testament, Noah is called a preacher of righteousness, which is interesting. Many people don't know that. It means during the entire time while he's building this ark, some 75 years, he was also a prophet. People say, hey, what you building there, Noah? What are you doing there? And he would tell them. For 75 years, he preached uh, repentance and God's judgment. Noah was chosen as a vehicle for God's plan because he was a righteous man, and he was a righteous man because he believed God and he obeyed God. So Noah fought the battle of righteousness. Secondly, he fought the battle of faith. Battle of faith. Bill Cosby had a bit years ago, maybe in the 60s, called uh, an album, I remember having it called Right, when he tells the story of Noah. You know, he's got, God speaks to Noah, Noah, it's the Lord. Right, he says, I want you to build an ark, Noah. Right, what's an ark? You know, the whole thing is very funny. Uh, But God asked Noah to do a pretty ridiculous thing when you think about it. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, this giant boat, and you're going to bring all the animals of the world into it, and you're going to take care of them. Uh, Right, you know, right. First of all, the idea of a flood had to sound crazy. Uh, Noah lived in the region of Mesopotamia, the Middle East. I just took a trip a little over a month ago to the Middle East, and there's lots of sand in the Middle East. Um, it was a fertile area then, not because of rainfall, but because of the two great rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, and, 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 the, and the great seas that were, uh, that were around there. Uh, but the idea of, of rain uh, so heavy that could create a flood would have been preposterous. The idea of building a boat so far from the Mediterranean Sea or any large sea was ridiculous. The idea of gathering all those a- animals, ridiculous as well. Noah had to believe and trust God, and he did. He fought the battle of faith. And thirdly, it was the battle of obedience. He had to believe, but he had to obey. The great line in this whole story is this. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Can you imagine the ridicule and abuse Noah could have taken during all those 75 years? Building a boat in his backyard big enough of the size we're talking about? Can you imagine how foolish he must have felt when for 75 years he's preaching that God's judgment is coming and there's not a cloud in the sky? Can you imagine 75 years. So what can we learn from the life of Noah? 
Noah is an example of a life of faith. In fact, he's talked about in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah becomes an example of faith. Noah didn't need to test God before going into action. Noah didn't need to see at least clouds coming on the horizon. God said it. Noah obeyed. In uh, comparison to Adam, who stood by and did not confront truth and did not uh, obey God. Uh, there's evidence also that Noah was the result of generational faithfulness, generational obedience. His grand, great-grandfather Enoch walked with God. There's evidence that Noah's faith was handed down to him by the men of his generation. This is instructive to us. Finally, the story of Noah reminds us that sin is a life and death issue. Sin is a life and death issue. All sin destroys. All sin ultimately destroys. It destroys relationships. It destroys our souls. It destroys our relationship with God. It destroys us for all eternity. And ultimately, God will judge all sin. That's the story of the Bible. The New Testament tells us that Christ is the ark of our faith. Christ is the vehicle of salvation to avoid the judgment coming that is coming from God. Noah was a man of righteousness, faith, and obedience used by God as God brought salvation to the world. Now, I want to finish with a story that comes from my time in the Middle East. I've told several of them on weekends. This is one I have not told because I was hoping this guy might come visit us uh, this, this fall. We don't know if he's going to come or not. His name is Nader. Nader is about a 30-year-old, 32-year-old Muslim background believer in Jesus. He was raised in Bahrain. He's now living in um, Dubai. Um, he, at, his story revolves around uh, a time at the age of 15 when his mother um, caught him reading a Bible and held a knife to his throat and was going to slit his throat at 15. Uh, later, she tried to choke him to death when she found him again with a Bible. She failed both times to kill her own son um, that, because he was reading a Bible. Now, I'm going to back up a bit. His faith story begins with his grandfather, who was a missionary um, from uh, uh, Syria, I believe, to Bahrain. He was Christian. His grandfather was a Christian man. And he went as a missionary to do hospital work and compassion work there. Uh, and his missionary work w it, during his lifetime was a complete failure. Uh, Nader uh, uh, doesn't know if there was even one single convert um, to Christianity that when he was trying to serve people. And all seven of his own children became Muslims. Okay? So he failed as a missionary, and all seven of his own children become Muslims, uh, but the grandfather lived, uh, was still living when Nader was a young, young man. And he said he used to love it when his grandfather came to visit. His mother would only allow him to come for short periods of time, wouldn't allow him to bring a Bible, wouldn't allow him to talk about Jesus, wouldn't allow him to talk about God at all because she knew he was a Christian, and his mother was Muslim. But he loved it when his grandfather came because he, he just loved something about his grandfather was warm, was loving, was gracious, was fun, was peaceful, and he told stories. He loved to hear him tell stories. Okay, and then at one point when he was about 13 years old, his grandfather died, and Noah, uh, Nader's world fell apart uh, for the next couple of years, got involved with drugs, all sorts of stuff, until when he was about 15, he got a hold of a Bible. I can't remember who, who gave him the Bible. So he hid it under his bed and began to read it a little bit on his own, and he realized as he started to read through the Bible what his grandfather was, that he was a Christian. And he re started to recognize the stories that his grandfather would tell him in veiled ways were all stories about Jesus. And he had had an influence on his life, and Nader eventually became a Christian. And then, to fast forward, Nader's entire family now, plus the mother who tried to kill him, are all followers of Jesus. The point is, one righteous man can have generational impact. A man of faith, a man of righteousness, and a man of obedience. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table today of all we've talked about. First, have you ever known such a righteous man in your life? Who was he? What was he like? And what kind of influence has he had on your life? Secondly, has God ever called you to do something crazy for him? Not, maybe not build a boat in your backyard, but uh, take a vacation, build houses in Mexico, or invite your boss to team. Has, he ever invited, has God ever challenged you to do something crazy for him. Thirdly, have you ever hesitated to obey God because you feared what people around you would think if you did? So those three questions. Uh, get some coffee. I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.